I've gone through so many alterations of this schematic guessing where the neon bulb goes that I've gotten pretty tired of moving it around. I think I've moved it around to four different places. And this is the only one that makes sense. And to me now, anyway, because of the work I've done in moving away from dwelling on this topic by instead deriving a circuit from this and dwelling on that derivative. And that derivative basically throws out everything except the spark gap, the neon bulb. The spark, a spark gap functioning as a neon bulb. Because that is extremely significant. A neon bulb is a negative resistor. Any gas discharge tube such as a fluorescent tube without the ballast, because the ballast of a fluorescent tube chokes that tube to prevent it from functioning as a negative resistor in its full freedom of wanting to do so. And it also um, lights the bulb, the fluorescent bulb, because it's hard to, to ignite it. So actually they use a neon bulb in some instances to light that fluorescent bulb because it's easier to get a neon bulb to flash than it is a fluorescent bulb. Anyway, getting back to the topic, um, what I've done in my derivative is throw out everything except the neon bulb, put a capacitor in parallel with the neon bulb, and in the course of doing that der derivation before I threw out everything, at first all, the only thing I threw out was the grounding rods, and I replaced them with a daisy chain of three modules of Eric Dollard's analog computer in longitudinal magnetodielectric mode, LMD for short. And of course that analog computer is meant to create an analogy with AC transmission lines under certain conditions. The condition of LMD is that you bring your wires, your two wire transmission wires that are running side by side, you bring them together very close so close that they start having an inductive relationship, inductance, a very strong inductance. And you make a break, though, at the same time. You create this closeness, this proximity between the two wires, only in two locations, at the consumer's end and at the source's end, the, the power company's uh, production plant but all the transmission line in between you remove and you create this empty space but you induce a condition in the air in which it becomes a dielectric and that air then is the capacitors of an LMD module I'll show you a, an example in a minute anywho before I get to that derivative um, so I did that, and I realized I don't need, maybe I don't need a Barbosa and Lila anymore. Just hold on to the neon bulb and its capacitor, capacitor that runs in parallel with it. I think I was using a 40 nanofarad capacitor in my simulator. Or not mine, but in Paul Falstead's and Ian Sharp's uh, simulator that I'm using. Um, and I realized maybe I should just throw out the rest of Barbosa and Lila and keep the neon bulb and the capacitor and keep the daisy chain of LMD modules. And I got pretty good results. It didn't matter whether I had the Barbosa and Lille because I wasn't connect I didn't have a captor loop. I didn't know how to simulate that. That might be why I, I, it was worthwhile to throw out everything else because I wasn't making connection to the electric keeper in the middle because my captor I had no captor loop function in the simulator. I mean, I tried, but I could see it, it wasn't happening and I didn't know how to create one um, analogous to what the capture loop does. So I just gave up. Um, but in that monkeying around with that deri derivative circuit, I came to appreciate the electric keeper, the loop of wire in the middle of Barbosa and Lille, and a capacitor strung in parallel with the neon bulb. And the purpose of that capacitor is to make the neon bulb flash less often, whose consequence is to broaden or um, yeah broaden 
the height and depth of each arc on the oscilloscope. If you're doing an oscilloscope readout of the neon bulbs flashing or arcing, um, when it happens, when you suppress it with a capacitor in parallel, it increases the a charge in that stored capacitor, which finally, when it gets released, when it jumps across the the gas inside the two electrodes of the neon bulb, it's a heck of an arc. It's a heck of an intensity. And on the oscilloscope, it means the height and, and depth of that arc is improved, meaning that um, arc, that spark, has more power, more punch. And I thought, oh, that's good. I mean, I was doing it aesthetically at first because I didn't, you know, I, when I was monkeying with the different values of my derived circuit, I got um, a compression of the waves in time, meaning that the frequency was increased and the wavelength was reduced. And it was so much so that it looked like somebody took a brush of yellow paint representing amperage in the simulator and green paint rep representing uh, voltage and just, you know, took his wide brush and went across the whole screen. It was a wash of color. And I thought, this doesn't look good. For some reason, to me, it didn't look good, right, you know, aesthetically. Because I didn't realize it was a matter of frequency at the time. I just thought, well, this is weird. Maybe it, it's fuzzy. Maybe it can't make up its mind where the uh, arc is happening. No, it knew. It just was time compressing it to the point that I couldn't see it because my simulator was running at, at an increment of five microseconds. And I could have changed that increment, and then I would have seen, you know, possibly seen the, um, the nice um, flashes nice neatly drawn out on the oscilloscope, but I didn't, you know, think of that. I just tried to repress it, and so what I did was I put in a capacitor, and I monkeyed with its values, and I found that 40 nanofarads in this condition, or 47 nanofarads without Barbosa and Leal's circuitry, was the ideal um, capacitance of that uh, capacitor to get the nice flashing effect of the neon bulb. <coughs> Well, I got curious, and I looked up neon bulbs online and, and uh, Wikipedia. They have a whole article devoted to negative resistors, or negative resistance. I can't remember which, uh, but it's one or the other. It might redirect to, to the same article either way you put it in. And they list neon bulbs, and they talk about fluorescent bulb tubes without the blast. And they make some obfuscating... D uh, description up in the introduction of the article saying, well, with a gas discharge tube, when the amperage goes up, the voltage goes up. And when the voltage goes up, the amperage goes up. And I'm going, what? That just sounds like an attorney talking, you know? Circular arguments, you know? It doesn't say a thing. It's not how you define anything. But further down, they throw some equations at you. And the first one they do is they take Ohm's law and take the reciprocal of Ohm's law. So, they took Ohm's law in the form of um, current, or I, equals uh, voltage, uh, with that, which I think they used the letter V, divided by resistance, the letter R. And they took in th and the reciprocal of that um, fraction so that now, in the case of a negative resistor, that was a positive resistance or normal resistance, but in a, as a negative resistor, you get amperage equals resistance divided by voltage. Now, if voltage stays the same, and, you know, in our circuits, they do. we got rock solid, what is it, 115 volts out, coming out of our outlet, or 120. I set my neon bulb for 120 volts. Um, no, I set my power source in my, in my simulator for 120 volts. So my neon bulb was getting 120 volts, and I set the, you know, the... Um, the characteristics according to what I had look, researched online, how do you simulate a neon bulb. So I used those. I didn't try to monkey with that. I used exactly what the person said to use. 65 volt strike voltage, um, 3 kilo ohms minimum, 10 mega ohms maximum, and 3 kilo amps, no, 3 milli amps follow through flow through amperage. Because Clarence said zero amperage, but you know, three milliamps probably amounts to the same thing. I just used what I found online. I didn't want to 
come up with anything new or different because I'm trying to come, you know, at least use some precedence in, in the course of monkeying with everything else. Um, and I came to appreciate the value of the spark gap in this circuit and the value of a capacitor across it and the value of Eric Dollard's LMD chain, daisy chain of LMD modules. And everything else I don't really appreciate. I mean, but an L LMD daisy chain, just one module, is very similar to the two toroids and the electric keeper in between, the primaries on each toroid and the, this so-called secondary loop that's linking them together. It's very similar. It's, it's quite different, too, in how the LMD module is configured. I mean, it's not the same as what Clarence does. You know, there's no attempt to neutralize the lens effect. In fact, of the four different permutations possible of how I could arrange the, the connections and the primaries and the secondaries, I realized uh, it was better to induce the lens effect than avoid it when doing the derivative circuit. I'll show you the schematic in a minute. I'm just <laughs> trying to do one thing at a time, like hold my camera and talk. Um, so, I went back to this schematic because I have all these instances of where I'm guessing where the neon bulb goes. And I came up with like four different varieties or something, or four or five. And I'm going, well, this isn't right. I gotta, come on now, I gotta settle this thing. So how can I try to come to a conclusion, an argument, a reasonable argument based on something? And i basing now my latest argument, going back to this variety of putting the neon bulb up here connected to the hot line coming in from plug number one that is connected to the shunt that goes down to the electric keeper and also goes off to the power, the, t the, the uh, line, the hot line of the power. Or, excuse me, the load. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then the other end of the neon bulb goes through its 100 k ohm resistor and then goes to the return line, uh, at the grounding line, that goes to the captor loop. Now, the captor loop, the wire, the grounding wire, is 6 aug, okay? It's 6 gauge, 6 gauge. Come on, focus. Well, as best you can, that's 6. <laughs> it's fuzzy in the schematic anyway. And so, let's see if I can get this without shaking it. Okay, so we've got our neon bulb in parallel with the captor loop and its connection which is just happens to be in parallel with this shunt. Oh. <laughs> hmm. And via, via the captor loop. Now the captor loop is gauge 6, which means it's got a, you know, moderate amount of insulation on the wire. And that means there's capacitance between the, the windings. There's only like one or two windings, maybe two and a half at the most. But still, you got some windings and you got space between them. Now, if you had only one toroid, this argument won't apply because you'll just go once through the middle of the toroid with your ca so-called um, captor loop. Be um, no, excuse me, the electric keeper goes once through. No, you still wrap it on the, the electric keeper, one or two wraps. And so you'll, get, you, you'll still get the, in, the, the capacitance between the windings as well as the inductance between the loop and the, the electric keeper wire that it's wound around. Now that capacitance, to me, is equivalent to if a capacitor had been run across the neon bulb. But since I could not simulate the captor loop in my simulator, I couldn't get that. See, now I get it looking at it. So it has a capacitor across the neon bulb already, the captor loop. And we even have a shunt in parallel with the neon bulb and the captor loop. Um, in li in line with each other, it's in line. It's it's um, in parallel with this shunt that goes to the. I've seen everybody in their replications. They put the shunt on the opposite side of the keeper to the captor loop. Okay, be that as it may, but it's in parallel, more or less, in a sense, even though it's on the opposite side of the electric keeper. So I'm thinking, hey, it already has a ca capacitor across the neon bulb. That's interesting. So maybe this is the version that needs to be done because this is the only one that is in direct or in the closest proximity to being in parallel with this shunt is when it's connected such as it is here. 
Now I did another variety in which I brought down the top connection. Oh, come on now, focus. The top connection of the neon bulb. I brought it down to this line coming out of plug number two that goes to the toroid. And that doesn't make any sense. Because the only line that's broken is this uh, neutral coming out of plug number one that would have gone off to the load. That's the only one that's broken. I mean, this the line's going to, you know, the line and the neutral going to the um, toroids is a solid connection all the way around. And so it would make sense to use the neon bulb as an assistance to cover for this break. You're literally shorting out the line and the neutral, but not really, because you don't go to the four capture loop uh, neutral. You go to the 56. You jump across the earth. So you're making a short across the earth with this neon bulb, which makes sense because you're trying to store up a charge sufficient to start it to arc to create what you don't have happening inside the earth. Now you don't want a short in the earth because a short would be represented by a resistor here. You would put a resistor, see the resistor here? You would have the resistor alone without the neon bulb. And that is the wrong kind of short. That's similar to what Clarence talked about. If it should rain and sog up the earth, such as it does in his area, his uh, his Barbosa and Leal doesn't work so well because the earth the earth is ground is, the earth ground system is shorted out between the two sets of rods. But when we put a neon bulb there, then that resistor does not have a chance to short out the two sets because once the strike voltage is reached, the if I can remember now that correctly the threshold for striking goes back up and the amperage goes, excuse me, the resistance goes down, um, but the strike voltage, I think that goes up, and that means the amperage can flow without a, hardly any voltage being registered within that pathway. And that pathway is parallel to the earth between the two sets of rods, and that's what we want to have happen. See, the whole point of having a spark gap, a neon uh, bulb, a gas discharge tube in any circuit is to share the characteristics of that spark gap with the circuit. And in my simulations of my derived circuit, my derivative circuit, um, depending on how I configure it, to one degree or another, the characteristics of that spark gap, that neon bulb, that negative resistor, get shared with everything else in the circuit. But here, by the looks of things, I'll take a guess that it's only shared with the Earth, the space between the two sets of rods. And that's perfectly what we want. We want the characteristic of the neon bulb, a negative resistor, we, to be imparted to the Earth so that the Earth becomes a negative resistor, and that's why the Earth becomes a source of free energy for Barbosa and Leal because we turn the Earth into a negative resistor. That's the way to explain this thing. Anything else would be going beyond my capacity at the moment to explain because I've never replicated Barbosa and Leal, not even in my simulators, so why, who am I to uh, make analysis? But based on my um, analysis of a spark gap, I bet you that's what's happening. If the neon bulb is connected in this fashion, and so it helps me decide where to put it. Because negative resistance is the most important thing in this circuit. And where we put the neon bulb is going to be most importantly, because it's not good enough um, that the neon bulb is a negative resistor, because if that were the case, we wouldn't need grounding rods. We would just connect the two sets together with a wire across here, and um, the neon bulb would do all the work. Well, it can't. All it can do is initiate, just like it initiates turning on um, the flow of current, or amperage, I should say, within the interior of a fluorescent tube. Likewise, it's turning on the fluorescence, shall we say, and it might be appropriate to say it, turning on the fluorescence between the two sets of grounding rods through the Earth. We, we get the Earth to fluoresce, so to speak, 
inside the earth, in between the two sets of rods, we got ourselves a functional Barbosa and Leal self-running generator, according to Clarence's repli successful replication. So that's the correct way to analyze the situation, predicated on where the neon bulb goes and why in the circuit. Since uh, Clarence has not publicly disclosed where the neon bulb goes, all I can do is ask, excuse me, all I can do is guess if I don't ask him. And I've always uh, set myself the challenge in the beginning of running on the assumption that if it's not public, then I don't need to know. If somebody wants to keep something a secret, then I don't need to know what it is. It doesn't mean I, I, I don't need to figure it out on my own, but it means I don't need to know what that secret is. I don't believe in secrets. I, I learned early on, I, I was of the opinion, very strong opinion early on in life when I was 15, that there are no secrets, only mysteries. And whether or not we deserve to know. So we apply our attention, and maybe we find it out, or maybe we don't. Or maybe we don't find it out today, maybe we find it out tomorrow, or ten years from now, or on our deathbed. But eventually, we probably will. Maybe in our next lifetime. Who knows? Because there are no secrets, only mysteries, and whether or not we deserve to know. And deserving is not a moral question, necessarily. It's partly one. But it's also partly a technical one. In other words, as uh, John Bedini said in the 2013 conference, those skilled in the art, you know, a nice uh, expression that patent attorneys and inventors like to use in the course of the text within a patent, those skilled in the art. In other words, we're not going to tell you. <laughs> but if you knew what I knew, then you'd already know. So why do I have to tell you? <laughs> well, my job is to take mysteries, as I see it, and troubleshoot them, figure out, figure them out. It's like, you know, a crossword puzzle aficionado who loves to do crossword puzzles, or my mom was great at figuring out the whodunit mystery. She knew right away in the beginning of the movie who done it, and I'm going, what? How do you know that? <laughs> and she'd just shrug her shoulders, you know? <laughs> Not that it was a secret, she just knew. I could never figure out who done it, because maybe uh, murders are not my thing. But abstract thinking is. But I am not skilled in the artistry of electrical theory. Let's face it. I have no background whatsoever on purpose, by design. Because whenever I took a college-level course, I only tried twice, of elect beginning electrical theory, I said, screw this, and I was out the door. Because they put, spent so much time emphasizing equations. And you know what? If I don't know the interrelationships between these components, how they function in relation to each other, at the very least, but more importantly, if I don't know abstract concepts, such as what Eric Dollard and Jim Murray and all the, the, those gang of guys and gals, Jean, uh, Jean, Jeanette, Jean Manning, Jean Manning, all those people talk about concepts, overarching archetypes. That's what I want to know. And then I want to know the conceptualization of how these various components interact with each other based on how, uh, what kind of compositional materials are used to make them. Because there are so many different ways to make a diode, so many different ways to make a capacitor based on what materials of construction are used. You know, all those little details not the detail of equations. Equations don't tell me anything. You know, equations are great if you're an architect, an electrical architect, and you want to engineer a um, circuit so that it's flawless, more or less, before you go and build it. And now that we have simulators, yoo -hoo! <laughs> Throw the equations out the door, almost. I mean, in my case, I can get, I can you kind of squeak by. Because all I have to do is monkey with it. And it takes no time to change the value of one component and another and change the connections. And if it blows up or it fries itself, no loss. I just, you know, <laughs> wipe the slate clean and start all over again. So it's really cool. It's not real life, you know. Um, for instance, all of my connections in a simulator are superconductors unless I put resistance in the wire. Put a little resistor in there, 
based on some computational, you know, calculation online that I would uh, probably derive, well, for that length of wire, I need a certain amount of resistance. Um, but otherwise, short of uh, details like that, I can do whatever the simulator can do, you know, based on the limitations of the simulator. For instance, I don't know how to make a capture loop, so fine. So I couldn't do Barbosa and Lee, so I had to do a derivative in order to get anywhere. But I learned a lot about spark, sparking gaps, and what they do to the entire circuit. It's phenomenal. It, like, it lights a fire that cannot be put out. When it comes to free energy, <clears throat> it is seemingly what the important thing to do when it comes to spark gaps involved is you use the spark gap just like you would use the, the igniter on a cigarette lighter, you know. Uh, nowadays, they have a little electric circuit in there, but in the old days, they used flint and steel and create a spark, and it would light the flame. Well, that's exactly what we want to do here, but the question is, what are you lighting? That's a very good question. What are you igniting? And I think it's the earth to function as a negative resistor um, in which... The resistance goes down and the amperage goes up, even though your, your sine wave inverter is rock solid at 120 volts, 60 cycles. But you don't want the resistance alone to go down between the two sets of grounding rods because that will just be a short. No, you want the resistance to go down, go down and the amperage to go up so that all that amperage can be fed in through the capture loop into the electric keeper. Because what does Clarence say on, on the overunity.com blog uh, uh, message thread for Barbosa and Leo when he first started out? He said, I want to look into this. If it's, you know, useful, uh, and it could be something interesting. He was saying, oh, well, now I lost my train of thought. Yeah, he was saying the electric keeper has no voltage. It's amperage without voltage because of the lens effect being neutralized between the two toroids. But see, that's not the only thing. It doesn't stop there. That's the predicate for the proper storage of energy accumulated or acquired, I should say, accumulated in the electric keeper, but acquired from the grounding rods. But they have to keep, pick it up the same way the electric keeper stores it, as an amperage phenomenon devoid of voltage. And the neon bulb managed to do just that. It sets up the right conditions between the two sets of grounding rods so that they can acquire amperage without voltage and pass it to the electric keeper through that very loose coupling of the cap captor loop. Because if the captor loop had any stronger inductive coupling, it would cause a lens effect of its own. So it has no more loops than the two loops of the electric keeper making um, inductive coupling with the two toroids. No more. The same number of loops and even the same direction, counterclockwise. So we don't want any voltage imprint, any inductive imprint, to create voltage in the electric keeper. We want to minimize that. And so we keep our electric keeper loops with the toroids minimized and we keep the, 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 the windings of the captor loop also minimized but we keep them all three in, in sync with each other. Same number of loops in the same direction. And because of the cancellation of the lens effect, now we can store the amperage that we garner from the Earth into this electric keeper to be used on demand by the load. So when the load asks for more, it gets more. And when it for asks for less, it gets less because less is stored here. One thing I noticed in my derivative of this circuit, the one that I derived that I managed to uh, monkey uh, play around with in the simulator, is that if you set up your circuit correctly, it won't go to infinity. I mean, you can make it go to infinity, but it, it won't do you any good because it'll fry itself. I mean, the, very, uh, the first thing to go will be that neon bulb, and that's probably why it's there, to make sure if lightning struck the Earth, you know, you wouldn't get a surge in the circuit, so the neon bulb would get fried. But also, the very first place that surges get started are in the circuit itself. You know, it's very interesting. I did a very, ex my first case of my derivative, I did various derivatives, actually, in my um, um, 
offshooting or uh, you know moving away from the study of Barbosa and Leal temporarily in my s simulating experimentation. I did various varieties and the first one just went to the ceiling but it doesn't go right away. It sits there and it's nothing interesting. Milliwatts and millivolts and you know nano and pico you know it's all very teeny weeny and it's not the neon bulb is not sparking and, uh, and you're waiting and you're waiting and you know in microsecond time you know it's like a bit of a wait you sit there and you sit there patiently finally very very gradually almost imperceptibly you notice the thing is upping all of its values and not just in one place of the circuit that I'll show you in a minute but everywhere within the circuit so I'm not sure the characteristic of the neon bulb gets gets um, localized to the earth between the two sets of grounding routes exclusively but at least it should start there to be the most intense there before it dissipates its negative resistance anywhere else within the circuit but you know what it has to be everywhere else in the circuit in order for a free energy device to operate the entire circuit has to take on the characteristics of a negative resistor to one degree or another including the load that's plugged in to the circuit they all have to because what happens is if we analyze the circuit minus the load conceptually speaking of course we can't separate it from the circuit we need that there and in a minute you'll see why the rest of the circuit becomes a monopole in which this becomes one pole of a dipole and the load becomes the other and so when the demand of the load goes up the supply goes up to match the supply within the circuit not necessarily from here if it if it goes up here you're gonna burn out this because it puts a strain on it and that's the wrong way for a free energy device to function exhibiting uh, negative resistance throughout its entire circuitry you don't want it over here that's the one place you don't want negative resistance so notice the neon ball doesn't short out the neutral coming out of plug number one it shorts out the ground return coming from the earth so it doesn't even go to any of these other leads coming out of the sine wave inverter oops so this is the only way to do it right <laughs> Other than the fact of wondering where does the top end of the neon bulb go, well, it, it should go there because of the break here between the two sets of grounding rods. That's, you know, why um, it goes there, because it's actually a kind of pseudo short between the line and the neutral of plug number one, without really being so. But we don't want the source to exhibit the characteristics of a negative resistor necessarily, because then it starts to look like the uh, power source is under strain. It'll have its, you know, rock solid um, 120 volt limit that has been placed on it, but everything else will get screwed. The amperage will go sky high, the wattage will go sky high, and the voltage difference between what and what I don't know also goes up through the roof. The only thing that stays the same is what the sine wave inverter says it's putting out. That was the readout I was getting on my derivative circuits that I was testing in the simulator. And if if I did this did it this der derivation the wrong way, if I did it in such a manner that the whole circuit just went to infinity, it just gradually very in the beginning, very slowly, but once it started to get high enough Th such that the neon bulb started to flash, it just took off. And if I shut down by uh, putting a switch on the line coming out of the uh, plug number one, you know, as an analogy, because I wasn't doing it on this circuit, I was doing it on my derivative. If I put a switch there, making a, a break in the hot line leading to everything, but kept the neutral connected coming out of plug number one, the rest of the circuit shot up even faster. It was ridiculous. We're talking hundred, over a hundred billion gigawatts at the load, occurring at the load. Over a hundred billion gigawatts. And needless to say, the temperature of the load, I had a lamp in that simulator, was up around, uh, was it 200 million Kelvin or something? I mean, it was like ridiculous. Anywho. But that's only if you do it wrong. 
If you do it the right way, it, you, you won't put a strain on the sine wave in, uh, on the power source. I read about it online. When you increase voltage in the system because maybe you get all your, uh, your, your, your phases out of sync with each other, your power factor is screwed up, and it shows up as a strain at the power company, and you're not getting much power, but they're putting out a ton of power, very not efficiently, and they charge you all the same because you're the cause of the problem. You know, they find out you're the cause and so they bill you for, for the power you didn't use but what cost them anyway to deliver what, to deliver what, what scant amount ended up to arriving at your mains outside your building. So I learned I have to monkey with it to get things to run efficiently. So, now that I've stated all the facts as I see it, all the basic facts, now I have to show you the derivative or else I'd leave you wondering, what? What's he talking about? So let me back up a little and pause while I bring up that image. Well, when I was, before I went and derived um, my own version of a circuit to test in the simulator that I could test because, you know, there's no point in testing something if you can't build it. And if you can't create a capture loop, and if I don't know how, then I have to move on to something that I can simulate. So I, that's why I was motivated to create a derivation. Um, but this was the f one of the first. I had two that I was working with. This was without anything, um, because I couldn't simulate 56 grounding rods either. That was the other problem I couldn't simulate. But I got the, the, uh, the spark gap, and here it is where it's supposed to be, between the hot um, lead coming out of both plug number one and plug number two, because I put both sources together in parallel with each other here going across to the captor ground return. And then I had the, the four grounding rods coming out of the bottom of this um, power source. Oh, I'm sorry, this is no. I had, this was before I combined my two power sources. I have two here. So I have one powering the two toroids, and I have one powering um, the outer uh, element here. So this represents my two plugs. So this would be plug number two, and this over here on the left is plug number one. So I have the the neon bulb going here between just like it did in the other schematic if I can find it between the the hot line of plug number one and the captor ground return from the 56 grounding rods so I have it in the same place and it worked pretty good but it was nothing out of the ordinary let's see it um, the watts was 15 and a half the amps of the my bulb, I'm reading off the bulb, the, the, the amps of the bulb was 350 milliamps, and the temperature on the bulb was 1800 degrees Kelvin, which is standard for a bulb, and it's not even fully lit, so this kind of sucks, and it's kind of an understatement because when, uh, if all you had were two grounding rods, one going in and, uh, you know, one going in and one coming out, yeah, of course your power would suck, because your ground is not contributing anything. It's just a short. That's all it is. It's functioning as a short. Okay. So this was my first one, my one of two derivatives. My other one, now this is when I put in um, Eric Dollard's uh, analog computer in LMD mode with three modules daisy chained together and I put a re resistor at the far end here and I plugged it into my two grounding rods. So this is the exact same uh, situation except instead of the two grounding rods I have Eric Dollard's analog computer in LMD mode. Everything else is the same and look at the uh, the bulb. The bulb is lit up bright white and the readout is now the temperature on the bulb is now 2500 Kelvin. The watts is over 200. The amps is one and a quarter amps and the voltage difference is 173. So let's go back to the other schematic. We, we had 300 milliamps. The voltage difference was a mere 44 volts. The resistance was a little higher and the watts is a mere 15. And the temperature is merely 1800. So you see the difference there? It's a big difference. Just by putting in those three daisy chain modules in place of two grounding rods, effectively, you know, a soggy ground, basically. That much of an improvement enhance the output. And remember, in this emulation, in this simulation, the capture loop doesn't work. So it's like I'm wasting my time with this 
inner piece here. That's why I threw it away, because I wasn't... There was no transference of energy. I didn't know how to simulate the transfer of energy. So this was a waste. The only contribution was this short here, keeping the top here neutral at the, whenever this was neutral. Okay, this was just a screenshot, so I can't remember. I think, yeah, this was neutral because it reflected the fact that it was neutral coming out of this left-hand, uh, you know, plug number one power source. And so that made the whole um, electric keeper neutral, which also had the uh, impact of making the bottom end of the wire that connects... Oh, let's see, am I saying this right? The whole electric keeper is neutral. And the bottom end of um, the wire that connects the, the, the two primaries of the two toroids, the neutral line is also neutral. So everything's neutral it's supposed to be. Although I don't know if the electric keeper is supposed to be neutral. I guess it is, because it's not supposed to have any voltage. That's right. So, that's only the readout of the uh, bulb. And that shows the waveform of the bulb, how the voltage and the amperage. Uh, the smaller one is the amperage. And here is the waveform of my uh, number two power source. The um, voltage is leading the current because the, uh, the, the uh, scope uh, image is moving from right to left. And so the formation of the green voltage sine wave is prior to the yellow amperage sine wave by 90 degrees or slightly more. More or less 90 degrees. It's, it looks like it's slightly more because the, um, yeah, the amperage, the peak of the amperage is not crossing there. It almost looks like the uh, voltage sine wave is leaning to the left. It's not up and down, straight up and down, unlike the amperage, which, which is more or less up, straight up and down. So the, um, the sine wave of the voltage is skewed to the left. But here, plug number, uh, plug number one, the left-hand power source connected to here, everything is nice, neat, and orderly. It's in sync, just like it's in sync here at the lamp. It's also in sync here, probably because it's close to here, and this goes straight over to the lamp, so that's probably why, because it's all part of the same circuit outside. So I really have two different circuits, and it, <laughs> the inner one is isolated from the outer one, so that's probably why it's not behaving the same way. Anywho, moving right along. So that was my two um, sim attempts to simulate Barbosa and Leo. And I wasn't successful because I couldn't simulate a grounding rod system, but if I put in this LMD chain, my other problem was I could not simulate the captor loops. So I moved on to other things. Um, here, now this, before I did though, I put in a, a capacitor, 47 I discovered was the best one, to put in parallel with the uh, spark gap. And it shows, I get nice neat sparks. This is, the bottom one is the capacitor and the top one is the spark gap. And so you, it shows the steps that, mo that um, rise quickly and then drop off at a, at a slant. Because everything is left to right. So time-wise, everything on the left is prior to what comes later on the right-hand side. And so the spark does, does uh, a jolt up, a step straight up. And we see the capacitor does the same thing, but it does the curve... Um, it does the curve um, a little more steeply, it comes back down. It discharges more quickly than does the spark gap, okay? So that's the, th that's the change I made. You know, I, I made these changes gradually as I moved along be prior to leaving um, Barbosa and Leal all together. And so here I put the capacitor across the spark gap as well. Um, I didn't do a readout of the bulb. So you see the bulb is still yellow though, because of the, uh, the influence of the two grounding rods. But here, the bulb is bright white hot. So the LMD chain really helped correct for a soggy um, shorting earth. Okay, moving along. So this was one of the two um, examples online I got for how to emulate a neon bulb, Fla a flashing neon bulb. And this is where I got the idea to put a capacitor across the neon bulb. 
They have a resistor. It used a 220K instead of a 100K that uh, Clarence recommends. And here I have a 90 um, volt DC power source. So this is a DC situation to get pulses, DC pulses. Now you would want DC pulses if you did a DC version of Barbosa and Leo. You wouldn't want continuous DC because those toroids would be useless at that point. And the spark gap would be useless. Well, the spark gap creates the pulses. <laughs> and then we have ground here. So that was that. And then, um, what's this? Why is that different? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, these are the different the scopes. Here's the, um, the scope of the spark gap. That's the spoke, I think, of the capacitor. And that, I think, is the power source over there. So the power source is doing something funky. But that's the capacitor. The amperage is, is uh, changing state very rapidly, both up and down. It's charging and discharging. But the voltage is taking its sweet time to be charged up. And it's getting released much more quickly. In the same case, uh, with the voltage on the neon bulb, but here the capacitor is going up, the spikes on the the amperage I mean is going pointing spiking upwards in the positive direction, whereas here in the capacitor it's spiking downwards in the negative direction. That's the difference. Now this was the um, the other way to uh, simulate a neon bulb was with the use of an op amp. But here again, still they ha he has a capacitor across it in parallel to create the flashing effect. And here we get the s similar flashes, although they're a little different. As you can tell from the other, you know, the power source is the same and the capacitor is the same, but the, uh, the spark gap is different because here it's like this and here it's like this. I chose not to use this because, um, I don't know, it was a DC situation that did not um, lend itself for an AC situation. Here he has a power source in reverse. That's why it's got reverse polarity. It's red, which is um, negative, as opposed to the green, which is positive. It's out of sync. It's 180 degrees out of sync in this section of this, this simulation. But it shows me that what he's doing here is he's doing the same thing of, of, of what a spark gap does. It, it's, he's creating negative resistance by adding power. So he's got his power source over here, but he's got to add additional power over here to make this thing work. But with a spark gap, you don't have to do that, because it's already a negative resistor, because of the way it functions. So this was a very clever way to create a negative resistor without the use of a spark gap. Use an op amp in this configuration. So he's got a tra uh, transistor over here, and he's got a battery, a DC battery power source over here. I think it was 5 volts or something. He's got a 10 mega ohm resistor over here and a 3 mega ohm resistor over here. No, excuse me, 8. And that must represent the two states of ch change or two st states of resistance that a um, neon bulb simulated spark gap are. Usually you do 3 kilo ohm for the lesser value and 10 mega ohms for the greater value. Here he's got 8 mega ohms and 10 mega ohms for the two values. Um, and then he's got his protecting resistor over here, 220K, and I'm not sure what this one does over here. Uh, no, excuse me, I don't know what this one does over here, the 100. It must have to do with this loop over here that he has to put in. He has to put in a minimum of resistance. But he put in 4.7 microfarad capacitor. So I figured I would probably need a very small capacitor when I did my version. And I did. It ended up being 47 nanofarads, even less. Um, now, this was a funky thing. What is going on here? I don't know. For some reason, the lamp is fuzzy. The lamp output is fuzzy. And the second power source... You know what I did? I might have been changing the, the toroids. Might have been monkeying with the toroids. I don't know what I was doing. Oh, I see what I was did. I flipped the polarity of my two power sources. So the, point, the hot is pointing up instead of down. Actually, in Barbosa and Leo, they do point the hot points. No, the hot points up. That's right. So my other variety wasn't even correct. So look what happens. So actually, my other simulation was not accurate because I had the neutral 
up here coming out of my power sources. Let's go back and find that. Is this it? Oh no, these are the hots going up. So what am I doing differently? Oh, not here though. Here I have the hot going down here, but I have the hot here going up. Well yeah, they're two different ones. And here they're, they're different too. So in these two instances, I, I don't have things exactly the way they're supposed to be. But at this point, I've made it the same. I just haven't combined the two power sources. So I don't know what I... Well, there's no capacitor here. Maybe that's... <clears throat> I don't know what I'm do doing differently, but the waves are all messed up basically. So I was doing something which eventually would lead me to want to leave. See how messy? That's what I mean by a swath. The frequency. There's probably small frequencies riding a piggyback on the bigger frequency. So we get the, the, the waveform, the undulating waveform, but we get a, a wash of color, a fuzziness here too. There's here too, a little bit. So it shows there's smaller frequencies riding on top of the bigger frequency. It's not a nice clean sine wave. And there I stacked them again. So I'm trying different varieties here, I guess. I don't know what I'm doing. I've tried different outputs, and I tried to record it. Um, now here is when I get start getting interesting. I combine the two power sources into one power source. And it looks like I have it backwards. No. No, I have it correctly aligned. I have the neutral coming down and the hot going up. Because see, it makes this line neutral down here. And this is all positive up here. And I got the capacitor in there, and then I use grounding as a convenient way to bring a wire across so I don't cross wires, because I didn't want to cross wires here. I could have. It would have been amounted to the same thing. Now notice I'm using 10 farad capacitors. And I think I had either 100 or 300 Henrys on my transformers. So I had some huge values there, and I only had a 100 ohm resistor at the far end. Huge values. Um, I, that's probably why I, I managed to bo boost my um, lamp. My lamp is showing here. Oh, look at that. Oh, it got even hotter. One, almost two million Kelvin almost 60 kilowatts over 3 kilovolt difference and 18 amps on my lamp. So what's going on here? I'm getting, um, oh, and I'm getting a kilovolt readout. Where? Where was that now? Oh, that's the lamp. Yeah, 3 kilovolts. And look at the power source. The power source has the amplitude squashed, flattened out below the midline. That's the, the yellow there is the wave for the amplitude. It's really bizarre. I don't I can't remember what this scope was. Oh that's the um the spark gap. And the amperage and the um voltage are pretty much closely tied to each other. And it's so busy sparking that it's practically um, like Aaron Murakami's uh, plasma ignition spark. It's like, <laughs> it's no longer nice, clean sparks because the value, you know, is so high, 99 volts going across there. Um, it, and other things considered, <laughs> it's very strange waveform above the midline. But that one's even stranger. That's the lamp. So nothing's as it should be. Nothing's nice and clean. So this was when I started to get away from that. Later on, I made uh, a method that had all kinds of switches. But the one that I used initially when I got away from it was this one. Um, wait a minute, let me find it here. This one. Um, in as much as everything is, was exactly the same as it is here, except I didn't have a switch up here. So I had no way to shut this down, but it doesn't matter. When you shut it down, it skyrockets even faster. So this is what I did on the night of the 25th of fe February, uh, 2017. And this was my derivative. So what I did was I took out everything else of Barbosa and Leo, but I kept everything else. So I have it in the correct place. 
the uh, the protecting resistor is in the same place as in Barbosa and Leal as I had before. The capacitor that's run in parallel with the spark gap and the lamp, all that is in the same right place. And the power source, neutral pointing down and the hot pointing up. Everything is the same. I just gutted it of everything else and left just this remaining. And this thing takes off like a cherry bomb or a neutron bomb. I mean, it's unbelievable. So I veered away from it towards other more regulated um, methods. And this is one of them. This is a nice, it gives nice clean uh, waves over here. It's kind of messy over here. But the, but the lamps, and it's rock solid. Once it goes up, it's rock solid. You know, 120 volts and the power source, nearly 15 kilovolts of the two spark gaps, because I have them both top and bottom, and slightly over 5 kilovolts volts for the two capacitors that flank them here and here. And, um, no, I'm sorry, those are not, no, those are the capacitors in the central portion, my singular LMD module, 10 millifarad uh, capacitors and um, 100 microhenries on my transformers, and it's a 1 to 50 relationship, so the left side is 1, unit of Henry's versus the right side, which is 50 times greater. So I, I do nothing to try to cancel the lens effect. And those two inner capacitors are rock solid at f just over 5 kilovolts. Nice clean wave. And then my three lamps, the leftmost lamp is running the hottest at just over 30 kilovolts. And my two outside, and my two other lamps that are not really outside, they're connected inside to the keeper and they're on a diagonal that was the only way to do it um, in a healthy way to the circuit not in not parallel but on a diagonal so each one is a diagonal they're like mirrors of each other diagonal mirrors mirrors and they're rock solid at over four and a half kilovolts <clears throat> and I have some switches to disengage different parts um, which lamp I want to disengage so I have three circuits one, uh, three switches one for each and I have a switch at the power source on the on the hot side and um, it's very interesting the way it cools down. You can get it to cool down very nicely. So this is a nice regulated circuit. And this is the first of March. And you can go get the circuit at that shortcut link. And it loads into your browser ready to go. So that's, um, I think, what I have to show you. Oh, that's... That's what I was left with when uh, my disaster happened, and I tried to save it, and the transformers, the four transformers in the lamp just disappeared. But all these other components maintained their state. In the hundreds of gigaamps and the hundreds of billions of gigavolts, they continued to remember their state. And that's where you can find out how to um, replicate that. Also extreme unity over unity with the number two at the end is another version. And then Wipeout gives you this schematic of what I was left with. I saved, I was able to save this much and nothing more. So that, I think, concludes my run-through of, um, oh yeah, so what you have to do is you have to go to blank canvas, and then you have to go to get the text file at Extreme Unity over Unity, or Extreme over Unity with the number 2, and load it into the blank canvas, because I can't export this as a link. So I have two varieties of this. I have a, one with a lamp up here and a resistor over here, and then I have one in which I put another lamp over there because it gets pretty high power over there. So I figured, oh, why not, you know? What the hey? And uh, if I can go find... This is the, um, the other circuit I'm working on. I need more switches. <laughs> as much as this has, I need more. Um, yeah, I don't have a shortcut to this. In fact, I don't... Oh, wait. There it is. So you go to blank canvas and load the blank canvas, and then you go to uppercase B, uppercase L, underscore, uppercase L, uppercase M, uppercase D, underscore, little V, the number one, and a little D. And that's my latest uh, development of this derivative of Barbosa and Leal. So I call it Barbosa and Leal Simulation with Eric Dollage Analog Computer in LMD Mode, because I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening.
I think I made a boo-boo in my speech, so this is to correct what I said. In a negative resistor, what we want to happen is what happens in a negative resistor when the resistance goes up, the amperage also goes up. We want the resistance to go up because we want capacitance. We want to be able to store voltage as if it's a capacitor. But we don't want a capacitor to block the flow of amperage. We want more amperage. We don't want to block it. And that's what a negative resistor does. It gives us the best of both, both worlds. It gives us a short without losing our voltage, without um, the voltage dropping when the amperage flows. The voltage stays the same. It's not affected, but the amperage goes up. And instead of the voltage dropping, the resistance goes up as well to take the place of the drop of voltage when the amperage flows. Now, um, what was else was I going to say? <laughs> hmm, I forgot. Well, anyway, as I said before, we want to impart the characteristic of the neon bulb sparking gap to the earth between the two sets of grounding rods. And so if the ground now functions like a negative resistor then, in which we encourage resistance, discourage voltage drop, and encourage amperage magnification, we got the best of the both worlds. We got the best of everything. We really got it going at that point. Now, why would we need more grounding rods if the geomagnetism in the area is insufficient to support less grounding rods? That's a very good question because that would have something to do with the situation. Well, we want to maintain the voltage, and that's the only factor, the only factor left remaining as a variable that we have to supply at our end that the circuit cannot do for us. We have to maintain voltage such that the grounding rod system even works. I mean, it's no different than a sine wave inverter or a power source. We need a minimum voltage to run our appliances, you know, so we regulate the construction of our appliances based on what we know oh, gets put out, generally speaking, to everybody's uh, power outlet, 120 volts. And so all of our appliances are geared for that. And if they don't like it, they get a little power uh, thingy in the back that converts the power to what they want. So we got this, um, oh, this standard of voltage that's supplied to our devices. Well, here it's no different. When, when we have a Barbosa allele circuitry, we have a standard. And the sine wave inverter sets that standard. <coughs> uh, since this is running independent of the grid, but our ground rods have to comply. And if they can't comply, then there's a problem. Now, apparently, according to Clarence's description of his experiences, when we increase the load, if there's insufficient grounding rods, then we have to add more. And he only has to do that, he figures, because there's a lack of magnetism in the earth. So turning the earth into a negative resistor is somehow tied to a predicate of the Earth supplying a magnetic field. It has something to do with that, or else it wouldn't matter. In what way, I don't know, so I'm not going to speculate. I have no idea how to speculate. But in some way, in order to turn the Earth into a negative resistor under the influence of the uh, sparking neon bulb, the Earth has to comply with either sufficient magnetism or we have to comply with sufficient grounding rods, or both. El or else, we're not going to impart that characteristic of the neon bulb to the Earth and get the Earth to behave the way we want it to as a feeder for our circuit, as a supplier of additional energy of some kind or another. I'm still not. I'm still vague. I guess it's amperage we're supplying, but we need a certain minimum voltage as well. So we don't have to necessarily, we don't necessarily want more voltage. See, that was my analysis in the past. It's all about voltage. No, it's not. 
we need a minimum voltage that we don't want to lose, but it's additional optional amp amperage that we're garnering from the Earth without voltage necessarily. Just enough voltage to keep um, the whole circuitry running in conjunction with the Earth and the neon bulb. But we don't want necessarily additional voltage. Um, although that's the way he measures it, as I recall. He measures his RMS between... See, now that I forget. What were the two references? I think it was the neutral on the sine wave inverter and one of the sets of grounding rods. I guess the set of 56. That would make sense. Um, which is not the same connect to connection points of the, of the neon bulb. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, it's really the, ra uh, the RMS he's taking is between the two sets of grounding rods, basically. So he's trying to maintain voltage between them, and if his load increases, but his area has poor magnetism and or it rains, then he's got to add more rods. So it's a caveat of using the Earth as an additional source of power. That's the caveat. These are the caveats. Um, otherwise, Barbosa and Leo's circuit works by design. It works. It delivers. It delivers by design. But the Earth has to deliver too. And we have to make up the difference somehow by either locating it in the right place with a strong magnetic field in the earth or more grounding rods or both otherwise we won't be able to supply more load to uh, su supply more demand or supply more imposed upon us by the, the demands of the load and that's the best I can do sorry <laughs> I'm doing the best I can um, but I guess that's pretty good I keep getting more sharper on this but see, I had to simulate. I had to do some experiments, something to get my uh, brain dirty, my my mental fingernails dirty, dirt under my mental fingernails, at least something. Um, and the simulation uh, apparently was enough because the, the the most important thing to start off simulating was well, how do I simulate a, simulate a neon bulb? And with that under my belt, that's pretty much all I needed. And I didn't have to simulate a uh, Barbosa and Lidl's Earth Captor device. I could simulate something else that was close enough. So I could understand how a neon bulb functions in the context of Barbosa and Lidl. And thus do a correct analysis of Barbosa and Lidl, as well as a, cr a correct guess estimate as to where the neon bulb goes and what is it connected to. With that much d done, that was my biggest hurdle. It's, I have a lot less to worry about, to wonder about. Anywho. <laughs> now that I think about it some more, the gas inside a neon bulb, it has to ionize. It cr creates these ionized tunnels of reduced resistance before it reaches its strike voltage. And ionization in a gas medium Sounds to me like it's not much different than what's going on inside the Earth between the two sets of grounding rods. There's the same thing going on between the two electrodes in a gas bulb, in a gas discharge bulb. Some sort of ionization potential of the, um, the grounds. So we're not setting up a voltage difference between the two rods as importantly as is the ionization of the, um, the fluid or the rocky material for that matter, in between the two rods, not for the purpose of creating a current, because we don't want to short out the two rod two sets of rods, but to create a condition of ionization which would be equivalent to capacitance, not I think of it. So we want resistance to go up because we want capacitance but we want amperage to go up as well. Um, now I don't understand fully negative resistors. It's something new to me. I still have a hard time with the, uh, with the reciprocal of Ohm's law, resistance divided by voltage equals amperage, to convey the ideology or the, um, the functionality of a negative resistor. I mean that's still difficult to wrap my mind around. But at least I'm trying to make some progress and it really has to do with understanding how the Earth functions in all of this, because it's the one ingredient 
that's not directly included or interjected in, in Barbosa and Lille's circuit. And so this dependency on the earth, the status of the material condition of the earth to provide uh, an easy access for extra energy for Barbosa and Lille's circuitry, it would be nice to understand it. You know, why is it, wh what does the magnetic field have to do with anything? And what does the neon bulb have to do with anything? And are they related? So these are the kinds of questions I'm trying to pose to myself, out loud, to you, and as well as to myself, to try to get a, a fix, as we say, when you're flying, to, to figure out your location when you're above ground so you know where to land. <laughs> and Because I, I want to understand this thing before I get involved in making it. You know, it would be nice and simple and say, oh, Clarence, tell me how to do it, and I'll do it, and I guess I don't have to understand. No, I want to understand before I do it. That's why I never took piano lessons, because my teacher kept, uh, I kept bugging my teacher for answers to my questions. Why are the 12 um, keys per scale, you know, chromatic notes, why aren't there 16? It would, to me, it would make more sense. But she didn't want to answer any questions. She said, just do what I tell you to do. She said, Mommy, I don't want to take piano lessons. Well, <laughs> So I haven't made the Barbosa and Lille because I don't understand it. But if I understand it, then I can appreciate the purpose of everything in there. And the one area in question still is the ground. The ground. What contribution does the Earth make? And how does it function in an interactive manner with this circuitry? And I still want to understand that. So the best way now for me to, is to try to draw a parallel between the interior of a gas discharge tube and the earth between the two sets of rods. And if the earth can behave like that gas of a neon bulb, then it can serve its purpose because in a sense it's just like a fluorescent ballast has a neon bulb inside of it to ignite the fluorescent tube. And if we're using the neon bulb to ignite the earth, to give us what we want, more amperage, um, but also along with more resistance, then this is an incredible idea to give us more amperage with more resistance. And the neon bulb is there to help facilitate that, but it's not enough on its own. The Earth has to make up the difference. And if it can't, then we have to make up the difference with grounding rods so it shows that the Earth is not behaving the way we want it to, ideally, which and how is that? Well, it must be as a parallelism that we can draw with a gas discharge tube. That must be how the Earth is behaving, and so maybe that's the only way to analyze the Earth's contribution to Barbosa and Lille's circuit, is that it has to contribute in a manner similar to a gas discharge tube. If not, it doesn't work. And if we have to add more grounding rods, that's like increase, increasing the surface area of one of the two electrodes in a neon bulb so that there's a difference in not only mass but probably more importantly surface area between the two electrodes which makes it a very special relationship but why would you want to do that because you're not getting polarization you're not getting voltage pol polarization the neon bulb is supposed to set that up but it can't do everything the earth has to make up the difference so yeah the neon bulb has something to do with polarization as well as phase as well as negative resistance, but the Earth has to make up the difference. And if it can't with a strong magnetic field, then we have to make up the difference with having more grounding rods among just one of the two sets of rods so that they are an imbalance, an asymmetry between the two sets. And, you know, what's the relationship? That, that's what I want to understand. So, if I understood better how a neon bulb works, then I guess I would understand better how the Earth works as a contributor. But at least I'm making a start. At least I'm trying to make a start anyway. <laughs>